Uh, hi, so my name's Thomas. I'm a web developer at uh, McGill University in Canada. Um, I've been working at McGill for uh, more than uh, 10 years. Um, I maintain the university's website uh, that includes uh, custom development, deployment support, uh, module updates, and uh, maintaining part of the infrastructure. You can reach me uh, by email on drupal.org, on GitHub, and on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, McGill University is one of the largest universities in Canada. We have many faculties, many courses, and many programs. Uh, many people study or work at McGill. So it's a large community, and that translates into uh, a large online presence. Uh, we have more than 1,000 Drupal websites. We have uh, 1,500 site managers to manage those websites. We receive a high volume of traffic, and we have uh, several hundred of thousands of pages. Um, so I work in uh, the web services team over there. Um, we report to Central IT. Uh, Central IT is uh, about 300 people, and we're a team of 10 uh, that includes uh, a manager, several uh, backend developers, including myself, a couple of front-end developers, and a couple of uh, support analysts. Um, we mostly work with uh, central communications and other IT teams, uh, such as uh, sysadmins, database administrators, and the security team. Our job is basically to provide um, websites for any department at the university that uh, requests one. Um, so we pretty much work with um, all departments uh, at the university. Our platform is popular because it's provided at no cost and it ensures compliance with uh, branding, security, privacy, SEO, um, updates, um, and all of that doesn't fall onto the shoulders of the site managers. We, we take care of that so, so they don't have to worry about it. Here are examples of websites that we maintain. So we have websites for faculties, for the course catalog, admissions, administrative departments, services, student life, museums, departments of study, external relations, research labs, conferences, and so on and so on. So we have overall um, more than a thousand uh, websites. So it's important for us to automate our processes uh, so that the, the site creation and the deployment processes are automated so that we don't have to manage all of that uh, manually. And we use Ansible and GitLab for that. And I will show how we use, uh, how we use those uh, in our processes. Here are a couple of examples of our websites. So that's the, the Faculty of Law. And this one is the Faculty of Music. As you can see, they look similar. It's, it's the, the same uh, design. Uh, the blocks look uh, similar. The, the header looks uh, similar. The menu looks uh, similar. The, the search box looks, uh, looks similar. It's basically the, the same theme. It's the same code hosted at the same place. And, and that's using a multi-site uh, Drupal uh, installation. When we release new features, we uh, release the new feature to all sites and not uh, to a single, single site. Um, that, uh, that provides a uniform uh, user experience and that also uh, ensures economies of scales. Uh, so, so basically, the, the marginal cost of uh, creating a new site is, uh, is, uh, is uh, negligible. So here's the agenda for uh, today. Uh, first, I'll describe how we automate the deployment of our infrastructure. Then I'll talk about how we automate the deployment of our application. And by application, I mean um, our Drupal sites. Um, I mean the, the Drupal code base and the, the configuration of our sites. Then how we automate our website uh, lifecycle. How do we create sites? Um, then I'll talk about how we automate our development environment and then how we um, run our tests. So how do we automate our infrastructure? Um, when I joined McGill uh, 10 years ago, our infrastructure looked like that. Um, we had four environments, uh, QA, training, live, and staging. QA is for our internal tests. Training is where we educate our site managers on how to uh, use our platform. Staging is where site managers can prepare their websites before it goes live, and live is our actual production environment. So we had three physical servers on-prem, and when we had to uh, deploy stuff, like when we had to change the Apache config, for instance, then we would manually connect to each server using SSH, then sudo as root, and then change the, the config manually. 
Um, that brought several issues. First, there was no guarantee that the environments were similar. So there was no guarantee that the server over here was similar to the, server, uh, the servers over there. There was no guarantee that the servers in a single environment were alike. Like those two guys, there was no guarantee that the Apache config was, uh, was, was the same. Uh, we had inappropriate permissions. Uh, like I said, we had to sudo as root in order to change the Apache config, and our sysadmins didn't really like it. Uh, so we had to basically enter manual commands, and when you, when you, enter, uh, when you enter a command and you make a mistake as root, then uh, things go, can go bad. And there was a lack of transparency. Uh, when uh, a team member deployed a change, then the, the rest of the team was not aware of the changes. And there was no trace of changes. It's always nice when, when you have an incident to be able to uh, list the recent changes so that you can pos uh, potentially identify the, the, where, the, where the problem uh, came from. So basically, we had no, no formal deployment process. And that became even worse when we switched to VMs. We started to segregate our environments and to have VMs specific to each environment. So we ended up with two VMs specific to QA, one VM specific to training, two VMs specific to staging, and eight servers specific to live. So we ended up with 13 machines that we had to, to, to provision and to, to maintain. Uh, so we realized that was not sustainable, um, and we needed automation. One of our team members attended a session about Ansible at uh, DrupalCon Austin in uh, 2014. So we, we decided to try it, and uh, we had uh, a lot of success with, uh, with it. Ansible is a configuration management system. Um, it basically provides you with an executable called Ansible Playbook over here. Um, and you provide that executable with uh, several files. You provide it with a list of hosts over here, um, and they are grouped by environment. So you have a group called QA with uh, two host names, QWeb1 and QWeb2, and a group for live. You also provide it with a list of tasks, which is called a playbook. Uh, so that's a, that's a YAML file in which you describe uh, how, how you want your servers to look like. So you can have a task to install specific uh, system packages, like, a, have, like a, a task to install a PHP, or a task to, to install Apache, or a task to, uh, to copy a, an, a configuration file. So in that case, uh, that's an example that shows how to uh, copy the Apache config. And if necessary, you provide it with templates. So that's a template uh, for the Apache config. So you provide, um, you provide the, the executable with those files, then you run it on your workstation, and then it will bring the servers into the state that you described. It will run the tasks uh, on, on the servers. So it will install the packages, the, the Apache config, and so on. Um, so that, that solved some of our problems um, because we're using the same uh, templates and the same tasks on all of our environments, then that guarantees that uh, all of the servers are configured the same way and that all, uh, all servers in a single environment are also configured uh, the same way. However, we realized that not everyone in the team had the same config on their workstation. Uh, maybe one of our team members would run, would run a specific version of Ansible and someone else would run a different version of Ansible or maybe with a different, uh, different settings. And also, we still had no idea of, of when people would uh, deploy changes. Around the same time, we switched to GitLab. Uh, GitLab is a Git repo, but it's also a continuous integration system. It's a private container registry. It's a hosting solution for static content. It's named uh, GitLab Pages. And it provides an API for pretty much everything. You can use the API to uh, create uh, Git commits, to schedule uh, CI pipelines, to manipulate the registry, and so on. It's also a ticketing system and a wiki. Uh, we use Jira and Confluence for the ticketing system and the wiki, uh, but otherwise we, we use GitLab for pretty much everything listed here, and I'll show, I'll show how. So we realized we could run Ansible in a container so that the, um, the execution environment would be uh, standard and uh, predictable, and we realized we could also run Ansible as part of the CI system. So that's what we did. So, um, we basically automated our deployment process, which now looks like that. We have a Git repo where we store our Ansible um, tasks and hosts. And whenever we need to make a change, let's say to, to change the, the Apache config, then we developers push the change to the Git repo, and that, that triggers a CI pipeline, which downloads an image from the private container registry, and that image only contains Ansible. And the CI pipeline then runs Ansible, so it connects as SSH 
on the, to, the, to the, the queue environment and then deploys the change, installs uh, Apache, PHP, and so on. Then we test on QA. If we're happy with the change, then we open a merge request to the deploy branch. Then our sysadmins can approve the pull request. They basically have a, a veto on, on any, any change. And when the merge takes place, then that triggers another pipeline which deploys uh, to our three production environments, so training, staging, and live. And as a bonus, the three environments are, are deployed uh, concurrently. So here's how our pipelines look like. Uh, so when we push to the main branch, our pipeline has two jobs. Uh, one is Ansible Lint, with, which is uh, provided uh, by, uh, by Ansible. It's a, it's a code review tool for Ansible. And then we have a job called Deploy QA, which runs the, uh, the Ansible playbook on, uh, on QA. So then we open the merge request and then the sysadmins can review the change. Then they have a diff of, uh, of the changes we wanna do. And then the sysadmins approve the merge request and then our production pipeline looks like that. It's similar to the QA version, but we have three environments, live staging and training. As a result, um, because Ansible runs as part of a GitLab job, we have access to the output and we are able to, to see the, the changes. We, we can see exactly what Ansible changed, what was deployed, and whether the deployment succeeds or not. We also have a history of all changes, so if there's an incident, then we just have to go into the, the GitLab interface and see what was recently merged and we, we can see potentially what caused the, the incident. That system was so good that we ended up using it on all of our um, infrastructure. So here's how our overall architecture looks like. The web traffic comes from here, so from the browsers. Uh, browsers fetch the IP address of our websites from the DNS. The traffic goes through our, our firewall and ends up on our load balancer, which also does a TLS termination. Then the traffic goes to our varnish servers, which distributes the load on our eight um, web servers, where we have Apache and Drupal installed. Our web servers have a, um, an integration with our solo cluster for search, our Redis cluster for uh, cache, and our MySQL uh, cluster for the database. We store users on an external file storage, we send logs to a syslog server, and we have an Active Directory server to manage user authorizations. So for each type of server, we have a Git repo with Ansible tasks that describe how the servers are supposed to look like. So we have a Git repo for Varnish, a Git repo for our web servers, a Git repo for Solar, for Redis, and for uh, MySQL. So now just by reading the, the Git repo, someone who joins our team would be able to discover everything about our infrastructure. They would be able to know exactly what's installed on our servers and how they're configured. And that also works uh, the other way around. Uh, we are able to discover how the servers of other team, teams are, uh, are configured. And that's the case for the MySQL servers, which are managed by the database administrators. We don't manage those uh, directly, but we are able to discover how they are configured, for instance, how they generate backups, how often, where they're stored, and so on. Now, sometimes um, when there's something urgent to do, when there's an incident, um, sometimes we manually connect to the servers and change something without changing the, uh, the, the Ansible uh, repo. And in that case, we have a mismatch between the servers and the Ansible tasks. We solve this by running GitLab scheduled pipeline. So we basically configured the GitLab pipeline to run on a regular basis. We do it weekly. So we run it on both branches, on main and on deploy. And as a result, that basically reconciles the Ansible playbooks with the config of the servers. So that was for the infrastructure part, so the stuff that runs as root. But we also, um, we also use the same type of, um, of automation at the application level. Like I said earlier, we have a thousand websites that are, uh, that are uh, hosted on a multi-site Drupal installation. That means that uh, we have a single copy of the Drupal core, um, the country modules, the custom modules, the themes, and the, uh, the config. And for each site, we have an Apache config file, we have a MySQL database, we have nine groups in Active Directory, and we have four directories, four public files, private file, temporary files, and language uh, and, uh, and translations. We also have a file for the Drush alias and a settings.php uh, file to, for, for Drupal. 
So that means that overall we have 1,000 Apache config files, 1,000 MySQL databases, 9,000 Active Directory groups, 4,000 uh, directories, 1,000 trash alias files, and 1,000 settings.php files. So we figured we, we should also automate that so we don't have to manage those uh, manually. So that's what we did. Um, <clears throat> so we, we added uh, some Ansible code to our regular repo where we store our code base. And when we push to that uh, repo, um, Ansible runs and deploys the code base and the settings.php files and creates the databases and the directories and the active directory groups and so on. So everything's automated the same way. The only difference with the other repo is that this one doesn't run as root, it's run as a, as a web, uh, as a regular user. So here's how our uh, repo looks like. Uh, so we have composed a JSON and composed dot lock at the root of the repo, and that's the, the web folder um, uh, where we store our our modules. And the Ansible tasks and host and so on are stored in in the same repo, but outside of the the, the document root, so they're they're not accessible by uh, by the public. And because that's stored in the same repo as our code base, we can open merge requests that affect both the code base and um, and the config. So for instance, when we need to install Redis, we need to list the Redis module in the, the config export, but we also need to change settings.php. So in a single merge request, we can do both. So that means we can deploy all of that to QA and then deploy all of that to prod. Our Git branching model looks like that. We have uh, two long running branches, one for main, one called main and one called QA. And whenever we need to work on a new feature, we uh, create a new branch for main, we push a few commits, and then we merge to QA, we test, and when we're happy, we merge to, to main. So that means we're able to deploy exactly one feature at a time, we don't, we don't group features, um, and then merge them to main. Our CI pipelines at the application level look like that, um, so we have um, that's for QA and this one is for the, the main branch. Um, so first we run a bunch of tests. These are the tests that don't require composer dependencies. We run them first because they're, 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 quicker, uh, they're, they're quicker to run. Then we build composer dependencies and then we run tests and those are the tests that require composer dependencies because that job takes uh, a long time to, to run. When all the tests succeed, we build regular dependencies. So this one includes dev dependencies, this one doesn't include dev dependencies. Then we synchronize dependencies to the servers. We basically run rsync and we, we deploy the, the dependencies. Then we run Ansible, so that will deploy the code and install settings.php and so on. And then we have post deploy jobs. So those are manual jobs that need to run after the regular deployment. I'll talk about those later. Uh, in the case of production, we also have uh, jobs to generate documentation and uh, manage uh, change management. I'll talk about those later. But what's great is that we have, at a single place, we have an overview of all of our processes, including code review, tests, deployments, reporting, documentation, and, and so on. And obviously, each job, each job uh, produces logs, and those logs are accessible by everyone in the team, so, so we have a visibility of, uh, of what happened. Um, in detail, um, our, this is uh, how our job that, look, that, that runs Ansible looks like. Uh, so it loads the image from our private registry, and that image only contains Ansible with a specific version of Ansible, so we know exactly what version of Ansible we run. And it runs Ansible, uh, and it would limit the execution to, to the live environment. Now sometimes when we deploy stuff, we need to do um, extra operations, uh, like when, you, when we create a new content type, we export the content type to the config export uh, folder, and then we deploy it, but then we need to re-import the config. In that case, we use um, post-deploy jobs, so those are listed in the post-deploy command. Those are all manual, and we run them only if necessary, depending on what was deployed. Uh, so we have three standard operations, one that update all sites, it basically runs dresh deploy on all sites. This one clears varnish, it runs a, a dresh command that clears varnish on all sites, and then this one clears the CSS and the JS cache on all sites, so it runs dresh CC, CSS, JS on, on all sites. So those three jobs uh, load the, the Ansible image from the private registry, 
and then they connect to uh, one of the servers of the, of the environment using Ansible, because Ansible already knows about the hosts. And then it loops over the sites, and then it runs the, 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 Dresh, uh, the Dresh command. We also use GitLab to reduce our bureaucracy. Um, by McGill IT policies, any change to production has to be disclosed in a central registry. We use a service now for that. Uh, so we basically have to fill in a form before we deploy, and we have to close that form after we deploy. Um, so we have a job that calls the ServiceNow API and basically fill in the form for us before the deployment happens. And after the deployment, after we, we ensure that everything is working, we have a manual job here, and when we, when we run that job, it, it automatically closes the, the change record and it, it posts a message in the chat room so that everyone in the team is aware that the, the, change, uh, the change took place. So it reduces bureaucracy and it, it saves us uh, time. We also use Ansible to detect updates. Uh, we use a, an open source project uh, called uh, Renovate. Uh, it's hosted on a GitHub. Um, that project basically scans your repo and looks for updates. So it's able to parse uh, composer uh, files. It's able to parse um, uh, yarn files, um, uh, GitLab CI files, and so on. Uh, so. Here are two examples um, of what it does. So in that case, it detected that we have a pending update for the XML sitemap module. So it automatically opened a merge request saying that, well, there's a, there's a new update for uh, the XML sitemap module, module and, and, and so we received a notification saying that uh, that merge request have been, has been opened. Uh, it also supports GitLab CI YAML uh, file, so in that case, when a new version of the, of the image has been tagged, then the project detected the update and it opened a, a image request so that we, we become aware that a new version of Ansible is ready to, to be used. So as a result, we don't need to monitor each of our country module on Drupal.org. The, the project uh, uh, does that for us and, and we have a nice dashboard that, uh, that lists all of the pending updates. So, so that's, uh, that's pretty convenient. Now we also use Ansible and GitLab to automate our website's lifecycle. Um, in order to, to manage our 1,000 websites, we have an internal tool based on Drupal, and for each environment, QA, training, staging, and live, it basically lists all of our websites, and it exposes basically a UI for non-technical people to trigger automation. Um, so when you click on that button outside there, then you have a form that allows you to, to create a, a website. I'll show later how that works. That exposes uh, several operations. We can create a website, delete a website, edit a website, rename it, copy websites uh, across environments. So for instance, when you have a, a site on staging, you can copy it to, to live, so you, you can promote it to, to production. You can also copy a website from, from live to QA if you want to troubleshoot uh, a, something that, that goes, uh, that, that's not working uh, on prod. Um, and by default, all sites use the same config, uh, but sometimes um, some of our sites require some extra functionality, like an extra module or an extra user role. In that case, we use the config split uh, module, um, and that tool allows us to assign a specific config split to uh, a specific site. So in that case, the arts website has a specific split called, called arts. The list of sites is not stored in the database. We basically fetch the list of sites from the Git repo using the GitLab API. We already have the list of sites in Ansible because we needed to generate all of the settings.php file and the, and the, the Drush YAML files and so on. So the tool just fetches the list of sites from, uh, from GitLab. So here's how our site creation process looks like. Uh, when a department requests a new site, our support analysts go into the tool and then fill, fill in that form. So they say, we want a new site called Megalot.ca slash new site. They pick a config split if necessary. And then when, when they submit that form, the tool will um, add the site to the list of sites in the Git repo using the GitLab API. That will trigger a CI pipeline with a single job called add site. 
and that job will run Ansible, so as a result, it will create settings.php, uh, the, the file directories uh, on, the, on the, the file system, it will create the MySQL database, and it will create the active directory groups um, uh, on the server. Then it will run trash site install, and then the site will be ready to use by a site manager. And then at the end, it will post a, a message in, in the chat room so that the whole team is aware that the new site has been created. So just by submitting the form, in 10 minutes, a new site is ready to be used by a, by a site manager. And it's all automated, and it's all uh, standard. Uh, so that was for the server part, but we also have a dev environment that's based on containers, and we use automation uh, in uh, that dev environment as well. Um, so our dev environment looks like that. We, it basically mimics our production environment, and we have one container for each uh, type of server. We have a container uh, that mimics the load balancer. We have one container for Varnish, one for Apache and Drupal, one for Solar, one for Redis, one for MySQL, and we have a Docker volume that simulates the, the external uh, file system. And whenever we work on a new feature or on a bug fix, uh, we create a new site. We, we typically create new site uh, every day whenever we, whenever we work on a new task. So we figured we could automate that process as well and ideally reuse the templates we have on the servers to recreate settings.php and the Dresh, uh, the Dresh uh, uh, YAML files uh, the same way we, we do it on, on the servers. So that's what we did. Um, because our Ansible code is in the same repo as our code base, we just had to add a, a new group called container in our hosts uh, file with a single, um, a single host called localhost. And we pass, we, we basically tell Ansible to run, uh, to run as a local connection. So it doesn't connect using SSH, it, it uses a, a local connection. And that works really well. Um, that, that allows us to, to basically create sites in the container the same way as we do on the servers so that we can detect issues in our dev environments before, before it's deployed to QA and to, and to prod. Whenever we need to work on the pipelines themselves, I find convenience to use VS Code's dev containers. Here's the idea. Um, when you run VS Code, uh, a regular VS Code instance, um, it will access the Ansible executable installed in the local operating system. When you run it with the dev containers extension, um, it will basically split VS Code into two processes. One process um, runs in the local operating system and basically takes care of the user interface and the other process is the server and, and runs in a container. As a result, you can run that part of VS Code inside um, the, the, the image inside the, the, the same image that we use for our GitLab CI pipeline. So as a result, you can have exactly the same version of Ansible and the same config of Ansible as what's used by the GitLab CI uh, jobs. So, so you, you know that you're testing um, Ansible in the same conditions as, as the GitLab CI pipeline. And as a result, also, we don't need to install Ansible on, on our laptop. So the, the interface of VS Code with the dev containers extension looks pretty much the same as a regular VS Code uh, instance. The difference is that you edit files inside the container, you have a shell that opens inside the container, the explorer shows files inside the container, and the extensions all run inside the container. Um, so as a result, in the shell, you, you can type exactly the same commands as what you would run in, in the GitLab CI job. And that also means that the extension would run exactly the same version of Ansible as what's used by the GitLab CI pipeline. Regarding tests, uh, so obviously we have a QA environment uh, where we test everything before uh, we deploy to prod, but we also have a bunch of tests that we automatically run in GitLab, in GitLab to detect issues as early as, as possible. So I'm talking about those guys here. Uh, and uh, only when those succeed, we move on to, to, to the deployment jobs. We run Ansible Lint, so that's a, an automated code review uh, tool for Ansible. Uh, that allows us to detect YAML formatting errors, risky file permissions, obsolete Ansible modules, and so on. Uh, we run it at three places. 
um, we run it in VS Code so that when you edit the code, if you introduce a problem, then uh, VS Code will highlight uh, um, the, the error. We run it in a get pre-commit hook uh, so that when you, uh, when you commit something that may, break, um, that may break Ansible, then the commit is rejected. And we run it in a GitLab CI pipeline over here so that when you push the code, then the, the pipeline will fail if you're introducing a, an issue. So we run it when we edit the code, when we commit the code, and when we push the code. Molecule is a, a framework for uh, running automated tests for Ansible. It runs as a sequence of tasks. Uh, in our case, we have four tasks, prepare, converge, uh, verify, and clean up. Uh, prepare will basically create a directory, a temporary directory where we can test, uh, when we can do our tests. Converge will basically execute our Ansible playbook uh, in that temporary directory. So it will create settings.php, uh, the Apache config files, and so on in that temporary directory. Um, verify will test what has been created in the uh, temporary directory. So it will, it will verify that uh, settings.php and so on look, uh, look good. And then cleanup will uh, wipe out the temporary directory. So that allows us to test for each cases. For instance, in the case of the root site, uh, we have some custom uh, Apache config. And that ensures that whenever we change the Apache config, we don't break that, uh, that special, uh, that, that, that edge case. When the job completes, uh, the results are exported to GitLab and they show up in the merge request like that so we can have a, an overview of, of whether they passed or not and which, uh, which tests uh, passed or not. Uh, we, ran, we ran several tests uh, uh, to test our PHP code. Um, the PHP linter is built into PHP and basically checks for the PHP syntax. Uh, PHP code sniffer checks uh, our code against a set of rule sets. Uh, we use a three rule set. We use a Drupal and Drupal practice, which are provided by the coder module. Uh, so Drupal will test for the, the coding standards and Drupal practice will test our code against um, best practices, it will verify that the labels are translatable, for instance. And we also use the PHP compatibility rule set, uh, which ensures that our code base is compatible with a specific version of PHP. Uh, so we use it whenever we need to upgrade to, uh, to, to a new version of PHP. Um, we also have a job uh, to run PHP Stan, which is a more advanced uh, static analysis tool. It will check for undefined variables, written types, uh, it will look for dead codes and so on. And just like Ansible Lint, we run these three tools when we edit the code, when we commit the code, and when we push the code so, so that we are aware that uh, things, uh, things break as early as possible. We install, we install uh, the code sniffer and the PHP stan using Drupal's core dev uh, composer package, uh, which ensures that we run exactly the same version as, uh, as Drupal core. Composer has a built-in uh, validate command that ensures that um, uh, that they, are, they don't have any JSON formatting error, and it also ensures that there's no mismatch between the two. Uh, for instance, it verified that it verifies that the the constraints listed in Composer.json are satisfied in Composer.lock. Um, so we have a dedicated job for that. Errors in those files are typically introduced when you merge code, uh, we merge changes that affect either composer.json or composer.lock, or when you manually change these files instead of calling composer require my package. We run ESLint and StyleLint uh, to ensure that our JS, our JS and CSS files observe uh, coding standards. And we have a job that runs a, a tool called Twig Linter, which uh, to my knowledge is not an official tool provided by, by Twig, uh, but it works well. It, uh, it basically ensures that our Twig templates are valid and that they use uh, valid filters. We also have a job to test our Drupal config. Uh, we realized that um, the Drupal config sometimes can be inconsistent. Um, here's an example. When you, when you enable the scheduler module, so when you list it in the core.extension.yaml file, um, 
the scheduler module is supposed to install a bunch of settings which are stored in a file called scheduler.settings.yaml if you export it. Um, so if, if the scheduler module is enabled, then you're supposed to have that file in your config export module. Um, so that job verifies that that's the case. The way we test that is by first running trash site install existing config. So we create a new site as part of the job and we load the, um, the config and then we run trash config status, and if there's a mismatch between the active config and the config export uh, files, then that means we found a discrepancy, and in that case, we, we fail the job, so we exit one. So that basically, that basically ensures that the config is internally consistent. Issues, issues with the config are typically introduced when you merge config files that, that affect the, the config export module, or when you manually edit the config files, like when you, when you manually edit that file and list a new, a new module as, as enabled. We also ran PHP unit, um, so that includes unit, kernel, and functional tests. In the case of functional tests, um, the, the test generate some HTML output that allows you to see exactly what the tests are doing, uh, what buttons they the click, uh, how the text fields are populated and so on. Uh, that output is, uh, we, we export it as an artifact so that it can be downloaded uh, if, if we want to inspect uh, what the test did. And we also publish it as a static site on GitLab pages so you can browse the output on the, on the GitLab, uh, GitLab pages interface. When that job completes, we export the results um, in JUnit format and then it shows up um, in the merge request summary so that you can have an overview of uh, whether the tests succeeded or not, um, along with the, our molecule test for, for Ansible. Um, Xdebug provides a functionality to generate a code coverage report, uh, which basically shows you which part of your tests, uh, which parts of your code base are covered by automated tests or not. Um, so it basically produces files like that. Um, so when you have a, a green line, then that means that some of your automated tests ran uh, those, uh, those lines. And when you have a, a red line, then that means that uh, your, that line is not covered. So you may have an edge case here that, that, uh, that's not covered. Um, it also provides you with a nice overview of uh, which percentage of lines, functions, and classes are covered um, uh, by your tests. Um, which is uh, which is nice, but um, there's a gotcha. It that that reports only accounts for unit and kernel tests. So if you have functional tests, then they they're not taken into account uh, when generating that uh, that report. Um, our upcoming challenges: uh, we Ansible has a has a check mode that allows you to preview changes before they are deployed. Uh, we'd like to integrate that into our uh, pipeline at some point. At some point. Uh, we'd like to automate uh, the synchronization of our secrets with our password manager. Uh, currently, all of our secrets are stored in the Ansible code. They're encrypted, but they're, they're hard-coded, and they, they may be different from what's stored in our, um, our password manager, so we'd like to automate that at some point. Uh, we'd like to run PHP unit in concurrent mode. Currently, uh, that job takes one hour to run, uh, so we'd like to split the tasks so that uh, you can run several tests in parallel and, it, uh, and make it uh, go faster. We'd like to increase our automated tests coverage. Some of our module are really well covered by automated tests, but others are not. And at some point, we'd like to deploy to the cloud uh, and possibly to Kubernetes. Uh, we're not sure yet whether Ansible and GitLab will, uh, will help us uh, to do that, but uh, we'll have to, to evaluate that. Uh, thanks for your attention. You can download the slides uh, uh, on that GitHub uh, repo, and you can reach me by email on Drupal.org, on GitHub, and on LinkedIn. Uh, if you have any question, go ahead. I'll also be at the Higher Ed Summit on Thursday if you want to discuss uh, any of that. Yep.
to the problems of setting up a multi-site. Uh, why did you go multi-site instead of the group module? Of the group module? Yeah. I'm not aware of the group module, sorry. We'll talk. Okay. <laughs> So the sysadmins, uh, I think there are a bunch, they're, they're a group of uh, five, five sysadmins, um, but they're, they're not dedicated to us, they take care of, of several systems. I think maybe two of them are more specialized on our system, um, but yeah. Yep. I have a question for you. Okay. Uh, first one, is your internal tool available as open source? Which internal tool? The one oh. to No, sorry. It's uh, no. <laughs> It's very customized. Okay, and my second question is, how does the database set up? Do you have multiple sites on one database, or do the each site have individual databases? Each, each site has one dedicated database. Yep. Um, yeah, so when, like, I thought the, the brush script thing, right, that's gonna, that's like a wrap anyway to run against all the sites? Yeah. Okay. So, question is, uh, what what happens when one of the one of the trash command fails? Um, so, if it fails, then it, it just stops. Um, so, it, it stops at the first site that that fails. Obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, we we have a look at the failure and and. Um, it depends. We, we try our best to not, not break sites. Some, sometimes you can deploy the code base and then run updates and it won't break any sites. If it does, then yeah, we, we put sites in, in maintenance mode. Yeah. Okay, so do you guys use PHP unit average deployment to verify that all of your sites are up, updated and working? PHP unit, we, we're in it as part of the pipeline, yeah, before the No, we test in QA, and then when it's good, we, we then deploy to prod. If if there's if if there's something to worry about, we test manually. But usually, usually we deploy, and then it, it's good. We typically deploy very small changes, so so okay, usually. Like major migrations like nine to ten, or. Oh, major, yeah. For when we migrate the site, of course, we we test. Yeah, but for regular deployment, like adding a new field to a content type or something, we, we just deploy, we don't, we don't test. Because here, those are a couple of screenshots for, from our internal tool where we manage our websites. So the way we migrate sites, um, first we create the site in Drupal 9, and we have, when we create a site in, in Drupal 9, and we soon we will upgrade to Drupal 10, we have a box here that says showing in Apache. So we basically create the site um, without the Apache config, so the site will exist, but it will not be accessible in, in Apache, so it will not be viewable. And then we have in that button, we have a button to migrate the site, so it will run the trash commands to migrate the site. So we will migrate the site from Drupal 7 to Drupal 10, it will exist, but it will not be accessible in Apache. And then we edit the site, we toggle that checkbox, so it becomes available in, in Apache, and then it becomes visible. And then, and then at that point, the site is visible in Drupal, Drupal 10 instead of Drupal 7. Yeah, the content types are when in Drupal 7 they were in features, in Drupal 10 they are in, in the config system, and we migrate the content using Drush, yeah, using the, the regular uh, migrate framework. What is the 
refresh here, um, it allows us to refresh the copy. So that site was created, was copied, so it's a, it's a QA site that was copied from the Life Site Academics. When you click on that button, it will copy the Life Site again to QA. So we refresh it from Prod. Yeah, you, you think, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, sometimes we create uh, redirects for vanity URLs. Um, yeah, otherwise, the, 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 the central comms department uh, decides on whether they are allowed to use certain, certain names or not. So how we manage config splits? Yeah, I have a slide for that as well. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> that's how we manage our config. So in Drupal, config, so in the sync folder we have our regular config which is used by all sites and in the splits folder we have uh, several splits. So those that are prepended with an underscore are specific to environments. So on dev, live, and QA we have some, some differences. Uh, like we enable varnish on live but not on, not on dev or stuff like that. And then for sites that require a split, in that case site one requires a, a split. So we, we store it here. And in the in settings.php, so for each site, settings.php include the a common settings.php here, settings.all.php. You see, you require Drupal.root, uh, and then, then it requires the, the common uh, file. And then we enable the, um, that split only for that site. So each, each site can have a, a, a split on top of the regular config. I can hear you, sorry. Oh, when you need to import? Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, so we, we edit the site, then we, we assign a split to that site and then that automatically reimports the config and, and creates the, the config on that side. Yeah, like the head slash level, when we construct the splits, that will be like a stable import. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so if your user ever changed the config, though, that might get like, like something to it? No, typically, Typically, what's in the config split is very simple. It's typically a, a specific user role or a, an AD group mapping or a, a specific module. So typically, they don't conflict with the, the, the common uh, config. I know. No, 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 I didn't, but uh, I can check it out. Uh, thanks. <laughs> All right. Another question? Well, thank you.